May 2002 is a psychological horror drama and also was when I was born into this fun little world of complete and utter nightmares. And thank God for that. <laughs> No, but seriously, May's kind of a cool, minorly overlooked, especially by the mainstream, little character piece, and I really kind of vibe with it. It takes on a slightly different objective to showcase something more raw and human when it comes to mental health, as opposed to the common archetypical, pure evil, unstoppable, uncontrollable, relentless slasher role that so often dominates in the genre, which to be fair, typically in storytelling are used more as like symbolic and embodiments of social fears and stigmas towards any number of things, really, as opposed to a fully fleshed, like authentic, mentally complex character. The inner struggle of the lead character here feels honest and sincere, thanks largely to Angela Bettis, who adds so much emotional weight and care. It's a role that probably could have easily jeopardized the whole project if portrayed poorly. Thankfully, that wasn't the case. May was written by and was the solo directorial debut of Lucky McKee and follows May Kennedy. Right off the bat, they establish her upbringing in a summarized recap for context. You see, May was diagnosed with amblyopia, commonly known as lazy eye, and so to help focus her vision, she wore an eye patch. Her mother, appearing to be quite controlling and perfectionistic, explains to her daughter that if she wants to make friends, it's best to keep imperfections hidden, something of which May puts into question until being proven otherwise by her fellow classmates. In the few moments that we get with May's mother, she's never shown to be outright abusive, but is more so raising May in a way that's in the mother's distorted perception of May's best interest. You know, like she was once in May's shoes and thinks that she knows how to solve the issue based on her personal past mistakes. The fear that May is also going to face judgment from the outside world, meaning she needs to pretend in order to be accepted by others. Rather than being understanding and a supportive figure on May's level, someone May can trust and confide in, there's a lack of emotional support and questioning her own parental ethics. She means well, but it is still still adding to the problem unwittingly. In the opening prologue, there's a pivotal scene where May's mother gives her a special, sentimental homemade doll from her childhood named Susie, and tells her that if you can't find friends, then make one, and that Susie needs to stay in her glass box because she is fragile and can't risk getting ruined. This essentially foreshadows the latter half of the film, as we will get to, spoiler alert, I, I guess. As an adult, May continues finding it difficult when it comes to socializing and really just being seen for who she is. There's attempts at searching for the perfect friend. However, the more she gets to know each person, she begins to pick up on all the negative aspects to that person, their true colors, until she's like, you know, maybe I never really saw anything in them to begin with. You can tell she's really absorbed a lot of the toxic ideas from her mother. May believes that things need to live up to a very perfect standard, especially physically. She often notices certain features that stand out to her, such as someone having beautiful hands, or a nice neck, or amazing legs, etc, etc. One day, May comes across a guy named Adam and quickly becomes infatuated with him and specifically his hands. When May starts wearing contacts that help center her lazy eyes, she assumes that this will make her what she deems perfect and help improve her social skills skills in order to impress Adam, basically having this impression that it will not only correct her lazy eye, but will also self-correct all that is weird and out of place in her life. After witnessing a series of failed attempts to try to get Adam to just uh, simply notice her, <laughs> He finally does, and the two kind of hit it off. Even if Adam initially sees May more so as this intriguing, quirky, manic pixie dream girl mystery that he's curious to learn more about in an erotic way rather than maybe seeing her as, I, I don't know, a, a real person and not some like fantasy trope. There's a lot of neurodivergent coding to May's character. It's implied though, not ever explicitly stated that she's on the spectrum and thankfully it never comes across as like insulting, framed in this 
stereotypical, offensive way that a lot of media depictions can so often come across. <laughs> it's more personal and not trying to create this caricature for the sake of almost parody. For instance, a pretty common ASD interest is collecting some type of item, and for May, that is collecting dolls. An interest that must have sparked in her childhood after receiving her only friend Susie. Also, when May is experiencing a positive emotion, she naturally dances and fidgets, which very well could be a form of stemming. Apart from this, May spends her free time sewing together her own outfits, a hobby that comes into use in her career, an environment not full of people, but as a veterinarian assistant at an animal hospital, where she's often needed for stitching post operations. May also works with Anna Ferris's character uh, Polly, the veterinarian receptionist who tries flirting with her, and it's Anna Ferris, so she delivers much of the film's comedic relief outside of other instances of much darker humor. Do you like pussy? What? Cat. Similar to how May is towards Adam, Polly tries and fails several times when it comes to making advances. You need your beauty rest. Not much of it, though. Although May does end up going out with Adam because they share a liking for gross things, things often considered taboo. May informs him that she hasn't ever had a boyfriend up to this point, warning him that she's a little on the weirder side, but feels assured once Adam responds saying that he finds weird things appealing. And I mean, May isn't like those other girls. <laughs> she enjoys horror movies. At one point, Adam creates a short splatter film featuring a romantic couple, and it starts off innocent enough until it becomes sexual cannibalism. He shows it to May, who enjoys it, finding it, in her words, sweet. And in her mind, she interprets him making this film as an indication that Adam has a kink for cannibal roleplay. So when they do have sex, she bites his lip and he doesn't take it well, thinking it's kind of pretty weird. And May is like, I thought you liked weird. And he's like, nope, not that weird. Adam also doesn't like her doll, Susie, thinks that's also a bit strange for an adult. Suddenly, he feels May isn't the outcast. He finds appealing and proceeds to leave. May lashes out at Susie, blaming her for everything. I told you to face the goddamn wall! And this begins May's kind of gradual emotional descent into psychosis and increased frustration with her place in the world. It's also the first real rift that she has with Adam. He stops calling her, answering when she calls him to try to patch things up. They pretty much stop interacting completely at a point. He's very much trying to avoid her at any cost. And he moves on to dating someone else. One night, she overhears him shit-talking about her as being this freak who he thought he'd never seem to escape. Even though she's only doing this because she cares about him, but doesn't know how to communicate that in a neurotypical, acceptable fashion, and it's really messy and bad and you feel for her quite a lot. So all this is happening, and I neglected to mention earlier that towards the end of the first act, May uses Susie to practice kissing. Though whenever she has her date with Adam, she does it too hard and- Oh Jesus Christ. <laughs> I taught you how to kiss. Susie. May blames Susie for not giving her good instructions and angrily slams her fist on the glass case holding the doll, causing it to crack. As the film goes along, the glass box encasing Susie begins to shatter, as does May's psyche. During the second act, while May is trying to find her place, her purpose, she decides to volunteer to help a school for disabled blind children. While working there, May identifies with and forms a friendship with a young girl named Petey who makes her a clay ashtray. Now, May never uh, used to smoke before, however, once she started going out with Adam, who did, she decided to as well to impress him, and now she's kind of just doing it, like, when she gets anxious. Kind of like as a replacement for cutting the tips of her fingers, which is something she does earlier in the film. Jesus, what are you doing? Relaxing. But on the note of Adam, uh, May is still heartbroken over the state of her relationship with him and still longing for a loving companionship. She considers that she might be open to getting romantic with Polly, seeing as Polly, similar to Adam, initially assures May that her weirdness 
doesn't bother her. Also, I mean, Polly has been working with her and crushing on May for some time now and always seemed down when it came to new experiences. However, Polly is one to sleep around, viewing sex as being open, like a fun pastime. One day, May catches her with a hooker named Ambrosia. Polly insists that it doesn't mean anything, nothing serious, and that May will always matter most to her. But May only understands monogamy and is emotionally confused by all of this poor communication of needs, wants, boundaries. And already having her heart broken, doesn't know how to internalize and process and becomes jealous of Ambrosia's perfect legs. And from here starts losing trust in just about everyone she meets. That everyone seems to have amazing, perfect parts to them. However, no one is perfect for May as a whole. The right fit for May's search for a partner who really gets her, who can communicate with her openly and honestly on the same level without being deceptive. Someone who doesn't treat her like a prop or an intriguing experiment. Since May can't seem to find comfort in people, she goes home in distress to her cat Loopy, who was given to her by Polly earlier in the film. When May tries to get her attention, she shows no interest in being around her, and so feeling as though she has lost any and all control, I mean like geez, not even the cat likes her now. In an act of frustration, May accidentally kills Loopy with the ashtray from Petey. Now this is where most viewers find May, you know, irredeemable, unjustified, lost any and all sympathy, what the hell. <laughs> and, and yeah, sure, what the hell, took it too far. I think it's quite fair to say that things are definitely definitely going south, though I don't know. I, I also don't think she really meant or knew she had the strength to kill the cat. Perhaps May wasn't thinking clearly in the moment. It seemed more driven from like this impulse due to stress. All these thoughts kind of were building up inside and she needed to release it. And I mean, she does kind of regret it after the fact. So uh, that there's that. <laughs> It still sucks. Don't worry, from here, only the humans who wronged her die. So, you know, that's nice. You love to see it. Queen shit. One day, May takes Susie with her to the school and introduces her to the kids as her best friend. The children try to take the doll out of its box, something May is not comfortable with. As you might remember, when she was a young child, her mother was like, you gotta suppress, hide, and keep Susie in the box. It's a plot device, sure, but I don't know, I think it's kind of an, an intriguing one. This ends up resulting in a painful tug of war until the box falls and shatters, and it's this ultimate symbolic breaking point, releasing whatever May had restrained deep inside of her all these years. And then uh, the kids attempt to grab the doll. However, there's glass everywhere and they are very blind. Uh, so, and May rubs a lot of glass in her eyes, which is great for me to see. Um, yikes. <laughs> Some days pass and May just seems kind of fed up, cynical and aloof with those around her. She meets a guy named Blank at a bus stop and he has the most punked out hair ever. The two don't really connect much, but she compliments his tattoo and they go back to May's apartment and he finds the cat in the freezer. Uh, so May panics, gets called a freak, cries, and then kills him. After this, we cut to her calmly smoking a cigarette before proclaiming that she needs more parts. Because she's planning to stitch together the perfect friend, you know, like her mother always said, If you can't find a friend, make one. So she's going to Victor Frankenstein, her own friend. Not really because she has a god complex, just because she's a victim of loneliness and feels isolated and in her mind, this is the only other way she can fulfill that desire. To create a literal life-sized physical being that is the closest thing to human. You're gonna look perfect. Anywho, for Halloween, yes, this is sort of a Halloween movie, she dresses up as her doll Susie, and with this newfound goal to construct this life-size doll, May sees herself as the one who's finally in control for once in her life. Either that or she's now embodying Susie, including whatever malicious personality that she associates with the doll. Hello, Polly, this is May. Happy Halloween. I was thinking about popping by later to bring you your new blouse. Give me a call if that's cool. Miss you. From here, May goes on a killing spree throughout the night. She starts out with Polly, who's like, Oh, May, sorry I've been so busy, haven't been able to call you. May's like, Oh, okay, what are you doing right now? And Polly's like, Nothing. 
Fucking wow. <laughs> All right, so they have this casual conversation until May puts two scalpels up to her throat. And despite Polly being kind of into it at first, soon she's like, I know you would never hurt me, May. But oops, she does. Then Ambrosia arrives. She kills her and makes a delicious glass of strawberry milk in the process because she's a queen. Sweet costume. You got any cold ones in there? Yes, I do. Lastly, she visits Adam, who drunkenly asks her what she's doing there. She's like, I need your hands, Adam. Then his new girlfriend, Hoop, pops out. May compliments her earrings. Get it, Hoop earrings. Her name's Hoop. <laughs> um, anyways, they go inside for a drink. May asks Adam if he could touch her face. And Hoop gawks at this and begins instigating, telling May that his hands belong to her now. And so May gets up and kills both of them. Before returning home to finish construction, her human-sized doll friend out of all her favorite pieces. Adam's hands, Blank's arms and torso, Ambrosia's legs, Polly's neck, Hoop's earrings, Susie's eyes, and probably the cat's fur for the hair, I'm assuming. She names her creation Amy, an anagram of May's name with the ashtray. Everyone played a signature role in what ultimately brought us up to this point. Though it's all done, right? May finally has a friend. Mission accomplished. That's it, right? happy ending. However, there is a catch, and this is where things get really kind of heavy and extremely heartbreaking to watch. May senses that something is off. Not even this friend can see her. Still isn't being recognized for who she is. This leads her to panicking and emotionally breaking down and desperately trying to get Amy to look at her. And the acting is amazingly effective. May puts her glasses on the doll and yet nothing. This goes on until coming to the conclusion that she needs to gouge out her lazy eye. I will say admittedly to break the mood for just a second, uh, I found this prosthetic to be really iffy here, unfortunately, even though I'll probably have to censor it anyway. But yes, she does this, puts her eye on the doll, still doesn't work. She cries some more until giving up and lying next to the doll and she's bleeding out, slowly dying, uh, and begins hallucinating in her final moments, the doll reaching over and comforting her in a very bittersweet conclusion to tie up this devastating tale of loneliness and battling this internal conflict, which is just the awful thing about it because like May isn't a cold-hearted evil monster. Yes, at a point it does shift its gears into slasher. However, it does more than a straightforward slasher in that it actually engages with the reality of the situation at hand, I guess. Because at the end of the day, the heart of the film lies in the alienation, the shame that May feels, that all she ever wanted was to be accepted for her interests and not needing to mask in order to conform, express and act in a traditional, neurotypical way. Funnily enough, when she takes on the slasher serial killer, role, that's when her communication skills become conventionally relatable. It's kind of like A Nightmare on Elm Street 2 in that sense, like suppress, hide your sexuality, and become the monster, meaning kill all those that you're not allowed to be attracted to, or don't, and live a life of truth. It's how May is conditioned by society that makes connections with others much more difficult. This lack of genuine relationships in her life and the social rejection that makes her feel isolated within this personal restraint, this fear that no one else is going to understand what you've been through, where you are in your life. Along the lines of conformity, the film also really highlights the truly awkward sides of ourselves as people that we aren't comfortable with and how we are embarrassed and wish to hide it in an effort to gain validation from others. The film kind of forces someone to confront all these things that they see about themselves as cringy or a level of weirdness that isn't attractive to them. Stuff that we can't ever engage with because that risks losing or lowering our social status. So let's mock and belittle them because they're cringy for having the confidence to show this side of themselves. They aren't cool and hip, but I am though. In the film, everyone keeps making all these assumptions about who May was and like, if you're told over and over that you're the problem, you're this dangerous little freak, people better watch out, approach with caution, the quiet ones, it's always them, it's only instigating the problem further and it only creates anxiety and paranoia in May. Maybe I am actually crazy. Maybe I am this evil monster. <laughs> 
Everyone keeps insisting that that's who I actually am. It doesn't help her mentally in any way. That's what leads her to spiral and ultimately manifested into seeking vengeance towards those who caused her this excruciating pain and self-loathing. This need for perfection not only for herself but for those around her. It's a tragic story that comments on and showcases a horrific reflection of our own society, and I really appreciated it. And it also has a great sense of humor, a decent comedic flair, because even at the lowest points in life, things are still absurd and life is kind of silly. Your surroundings are never fully dark and dramatic like some films portray it as, so I really like that this film encompasses that. I guess if I had to muster up some minor gripes I have with this film, not so much thematically or narratively speaking. However, I, I will say I found some of the gore effects to be kind of shoddy at times, and there are some other little errors and continuity things from time to time, though again it was McKee's solo directorial debut, not to mention the budget was just shy of 2 million, not adjusted for inflation, US dollars. And really for a film in this vein, the main focus really needs to be on the writing of the characters and making sure that they have decent actors to fill those roles, and it certainly doesn't disappoint on those two fronts, in my opinion. But what do you think of May? Have you seen it? I know this video was pretty spoilery. If you haven't, maybe you're like me and you don't mind spoilers and ruining things for yourself. I'd say it's still worth checking out. You can find it on Tubi. I think a Blu-ray re-release just came out if you live in the UK, so that's neat. Check that out. No, this video is not sponsored. <laughs> I just like supporting cool art, and uh, I'm assuming you do too. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.